So if we were going to type something into that box this morning, uh, I guess the word would be marijuana, which is um, odd for a sermon to be on marijuana. It's not really going to be on marijuana, but uh, that is the topic, and I'm a little surprised, more surprised to be speaking on it perhaps than you are to be here hearing about it. But I've had a while to see it coming. I shared this before, but just after Colorado legalized marijuana, I was in Denver for a conference. It was April 20th. I flew in, the conference started that evening. I flew in the morning, and I spent the afternoon in a coffee shop on the ground floor of this hotel, looking out a window and reading, and mostly looking out a window, because I was really shocked at the, at the parade of people that were going by. And I just kept going, wow, these, are, these people are not dressed like I expect people in downtown Denver to be dressed. They're dressed like they're on the campus of Berkeley or, or Boulder or, or going to a Woodstock concert. And I was like, wow, I just had no idea that Denver was this radically progressive. And then uh, after a few hours, it was about four o'clock, I decided I was gonna go for a run before dinner, so I changed clothes and I headed out the door. And as I'm running, the first group I go by, I smell marijuana smoke. And I go, oh, well, yeah, it's legal here in Colorado, I guess that's not a surprise. And then the next group I ran past, they were all smoking marijuana. I was like, wow, that's uh, interesting. And then the next group I ran past, everyone was smoking marijuana. I was like, oh my goodness. And pretty soon, I'm running thinking, I'm gonna end up high on this run because everywhere I go, people are smoking marijuana. And I like, everyone is smoking marijuana. I mean, everyone I saw was smoking marijuana. I was like, I had no idea that this is what was like in, in Denver. So it wasn't until that evening uh, when I'm, the conference started that they noted that, yes, here you are in Denver on, on April 20th, 420, which is sort of code for marijuana. And at 420 in the afternoon at 420 uh, was when everyone, people had been coming into uh, the downtown, uh, the, sort of the, the capital, right on the other side of the street. If I was just one block over, I would have seen that there were like 25,000 people that had gathered to smoke marijuana at 420. They'd been assembling all, all afternoon. I didn't know that, but I'm running past everyone right at 420 when everyone was smoking marijuana. So. It did get my attention, and then uh, uh, a year and a half ago, I was in Detroit. I had gone there to look at churches that were sort of on the cutting edge of helping um, bankrupt communities thrive, hopefully not looking forward into Illinois' future, but sort of doing that and looking at what are sort of the best practices of churches that are helping blighted, bankrupt areas. And uh, I, was, I spent some, an afternoon at this particular Episcopal church in downtown, or in, excuse me, in uh, Detroit that was in sort of one of the particularly, particularly bad areas. And the pastor of that church, the priest, was a guy who had been homeless, a uh, very winsome uh, guy, very much a character, sort of a street hustler who had, had great leadership gifts and cared for people and, and as, a, as a Christ follower had been able to help lots of people work with the gangs and other things. And mostly everyone else had moved out and so in this special little category, the Episcopal Church could ordain this guy and say, okay, this is now your church. Everyone else is gone, you're in charge. You can't be a priest at any other uh, Episcopal Church, but you are in charge of this church. And so he was working in this area and I, I asked him what I asked lots of Pastors, when we're talking, I said, so what are you, uh, what are you reading these days and what are, you, what are you preaching on? And he said, well, this past weekend, I, I preached on personal holiness. And he says, I started the sermon by uh, opening a bottle of Jack Daniels and taking a drink. And he says, then I, I lit a joint and I smoked this joint while I was giving my sermon. <laughs> and I said, really? And he said, uh, <laughs> yeah. He goes, I wanted to make the point that this was not the way forward. And uh, I just thought it was interesting. And he said, have you ever done anything like that? And I said, start a sermon by lighting a joint. Mm, haven't done that yet. It's not really even crossed my mind. But I thought, okay, so things are changing. And then uh, about six months ago, I went to visit my mom. She uh, lives in a retirement village. And one of her good friends, uh, so they're in their 80s, and one of her good friends, a retired professor at the University of Arkansas, 
Uh, as soon as I get there, they, they pick me up and this woman says, you know, Mike, I know you've got some residual pain from your stroke and you need to try. And she's got a variety of products that she says are gonna take my pain away. And it's, it's not marijuana, but it's CBD oil and a lot of things that are sort of in that general neighborhood. And she's pushing hard and, and uh, making lots of promises. And at the end, after I was there for a few days, I, uh, my mom's driving me back to the airport. And I said, Mom, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a big, I'm a grown up. And I said, I, I, I've been through life, high school, there was lots of drugs. And I was in a fraternity in college and I saw lots of drugs. I go, it's not like I haven't been around people trying to get me to use drugs before. But I must say, I wasn't expecting it in the retirement village to be rushed quite this frequently by your friends trying to get me to... Uh, to use. So I've seen this topic coming. I resisted it for a while, but uh, it seemed prudent to step back and to, to ask the question, how do we make decisions about moral and ethical issues that are confronting us? So a few things right out of the gate. I want to say I'm not actually preaching about pot. Uh, I, am, I want, to, want to preach about how we make decisions with marijuana and its upcoming legalization as a backdrop to that. So uh, I'm not gonna argue this morning on the basis of science or politics or psychology or, or legality. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna discuss any of that. Uh, that's not what I do, that's not who I am. We're gonna look uh, a little bit in Ephesians 5, mostly in 1 Corinthians 8 through 10 at how we make these kinds of decisions in the gray zone. So there are things that the Bible is very clear about, we're supposed to do, there's things the Bible is very clear about, we're not supposed to do. And then there's a lot, a huge area that's the gray zone. The Bible doesn't say anything about it. How do we make decisions in that gray zone? Secondly, I'm not talking uh, about medical marijuana in any way. I have no informed opinion or expertise to say anything about medical marijuana and its, uh, its offshoot. So my experience is that I have, I know three groups of people who smoke marijuana or somehow ingest marijuana. One, high school and college friends who, who were smoking in order to get high. They wanted to get buzzed, that, that was the goal. Secondly, uh, I know people who have used marijuana to try and uh, deal with glaucoma or to deal with the nausea related, especially around uh, some cancer treatments and other things, and are trying to navigate uh, difficult medical situations, physical. And then I've known uh, people who have uh, used marijuana in sort of a self-medicating way to try and deal with psychology, with, with, with with anxiety, to try and quiet the voices that they're hearing, to try and, and navigate that kind of mental pain. So I'm focusing on category one, people who are using marijuana to get stoned, to get, uh, to, to get uh, buzzed. Uh, I, I, I am a little bit skeptical and cynical of the medical marijuana industry in some segments. I am aware, for instance, you can go to some beaches in California and nurses in bikinis will take you to doctors who in 30 seconds will write a prescription for anxiety or insomnia and two minutes later you can have, you, you can have pot. And so um, I, I'm, I'm a little nervous about the way this sort of gets dealt with in some situations. I'm generally concerned given that the, the opioid crisis that we have, I'm not convinced that we do as much kind of longitudinal studies on some of these products as we might want to. So, uh, but I also see people who have been helped and I've talked with people who have been profoundly, their lives have been helped or their kids have been helped by medical marijuana. So uh, I'm not saying anything about the physical issues. I, I want the medical community, the pharmacological community to continue to explore options that, that help people. In terms of the, the self-medication for psychology or for anxiety and other things, I, I'm a little bit more nervous here because um, I'm, I'm not convinced that you're not, people are not hearing voices because they're using marijuana. And the more we look at this, the more we see that there is significant links between between marijuana use and some, uh, some mental health issues, schizophrenia and, and some psychosis. So 
I'm nervous about that, but I don't have an opinion about that. I'm not talking about that today. I'm talking about using marijuana to um, sort of have a good time. And the, the third thing I want to say right out of the gate is my hope and prayer has been that I can, I can share all of this without being a windbag or a self-righteous jerk. So uh, when I, shortly after I became a Christian, somebody said to me, you know, Christians don't uh, smoke, cuss, or chew, or go with girls that do. And uh, wow, is that a really, really bad statement, because it suggests that Christians are, are, are good by their own efforts, and that Christians are better than other people, and they have a higher standard, and completely misses the gospel, <laughs> in which a Christian is someone who realizes that they're a sinner, and that they're broken, and that they have no merit in and of themselves. And they come to the cross, and they experience the love and grace of God, and that they should, ex they should be sharing the love and grace of God with other people. So uh, we all have challenges. Drugs have not been my challenge. So I, uh, if it's your challenge, I hope that what you hear is hopeful and helpful and gracious. So having said all that, here's the situation we find ourselves in. In six weeks, uh, recreational marijuana will be legal in the state of Illinois. Illinois will become the 10th state in the union along with the District of Columbia to say that if you're over the age of 21, you can have up to three grams of, of marijuana and use it recreationally. And it's likely that uh, over the course of the next few years, more states will follow. The latest polls show close to 60% of Americans favoring legalized marijuana. And the, the number of, of users is going up dramatically. 2005, 3 million Americans used marijuana every day. 2016, uh, 8 million Americans smoked marijuana every day. And the percentage that smoke it occasionally has gone up by similar sort of astronomical rates. So, uh, used to be the question, if a Christian asked, you know, can I smoke marijuana? The answer was, no, it's illegal. And Romans 13 and other passages suggest that we should follow the laws of the land. Now, there are obviously exceptions, and so we're thankful for someone like Dr. Martin Luther King that fought against Jim Crow laws and, and said these laws are unjust and they need to be changed. But no one is suggesting that marijuana laws are, are unjust in that way. And so the question presented to a, a Christian, can you smoke marijuana, is it, is it okay? The answer would be, well, no, it's, it's actually illegal. It's not a good thing. Now, medical marijuana has changed four or five years ago, sort of changed some of that, uh, but it's all changing in this state in just a few weeks. So now the question specifically for us is, uh, is it okay to smoke a joint? In a way similar to having a glass of wine at a party with friends, could I smoke a joint? Uh, as a Christ follower, is this a, a, a legitimate, fine, good, wise thing to do? And um, that's what I want us to focus on. So as you might imagine, Christians are on all sides of every issue. They're on all sides of this issue. So I read lots of things. We were on lots of interesting websites uh, in the last month. And, and I broke them out into a handful of categories. So we have a spectrum here. On one end of the spectrum, there are people that say yes, always. Uh, there are people who sound somewhat like the Rastafarians, this, uh, this group out of Jamaica associated with Bob Marley, who, for whom marijuana is a sacrament and you're actually instructed to use marijuana. It's sort of a path to God. There are, there are Christians who, who, if you read their websites, sound sort of like you don't know God well unless you're smoking marijuana. It's, it's, a, it's a fringe group, but they're there. There's a second group right to the, a little bit uh, over that says, um, yes, whenever you'd like. God has given us uh, marijuana. So a passage almost always cited on these sites. First page of the Bible, Genesis 129. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. So this group says, God has given us marijuana. They also would cite Ezekiel chapter um, 20, uh, 24, 
that, that talks about a plant of renown being for our benefit, Revelation 22.2, that talks about uh, a plant for the healing of nations. And then recently, there's been this move to say that this Hebrew term, um, kanesh bosom, which occurs a dozen times in the Bible, is actually referring to marijuana. Kanesh is the word for reed, uh, and bosom is the word for fragrant. So the fragrant reed, previously understood to be cinnamon, uh, is actually <laughs> marijuana. And, uh, and so there's a lot of argument uh, that this is, look, that the, that the Bible is all for this, and in fact, uh, we're being instructed to use this, and that Jesus did, and he healed the blind man because they had glaucoma, and so he had him smoke, and this was the way forward, and so, yeah, there's a lot of things on the internet. So this is the, this, this category, I'll just say, um, I don't think, I've not found any Hebrew scholars uh, who think that this is a good interpretation of the word Canis Bosom. But let's imagine that it was. So uh, the THC, sort of the hallucinogenic compound in marijuana, sort of in a marijuana plant found undeveloped is about 5%. So over the years, we have been crossbreeding and, and you know, distilling this down. And so medical marijuana today is about 25% THC. And it's possible on the sort of the open market behind the high school kind of thing to get THC that's been, or marijuana that's been refined down to be three or four times that strong. So the marijuana out there today is nothing like the marijuana of 20 years ago. And it, it's the equivalent of, you know, watered down wine with grain alcohol. So, uh, I, I, yeah, so I, I don't think there's merit to this camp, but there is a camp that says, yes, God has given us marijuana to use. There's a third group that says, um, if it's illegal, it's wrong. If it's, uh, uh, yes, it's not a sin, even if illegal. So there's a group that says, yes, it's not a sin, even if it's illegal, we should be able to use this. Um, and, and there are some that say, look, the categories here, the way the Bible works is if the Bible says something is good, you can do it. If it doesn't say anything about it, you can do it. So there are some that say, if, if, if the Bible says it's good, it's good. If the Bible doesn't say it's good, it doesn't say anything about it, it's fine. It's not listed as a sin. There's another group that says if the Bible doesn't approve it, it's a sin. Neither of these camps, those that say, uh, you know, look, if, if it's not mentioned, it's good, and those that say if it's not mentioned, it's bad, neither of these are, are developed, thoughtful interpretations of Scripture. And they're naive and they're impossible to apply. But there are people in those camps. Then there's another group that comes along not long after that. This is the fourth group, and they say, if the state says it's okay, it's okay. So if it's legal, it's okay for you to use marijuana, which I think if you just step back and say, the state is not the arbiter of my moral compass, but there are some people that say, yes, if the state says it's okay, it's okay. There's a fifth group, and this group says, if it's legal, then the question is, um, how do you treat alcohol? You should be consistent and treat marijuana the same way you treat alcohol. Now, um, I may wish that I had stayed in Turkey longer than to give this sermon, but let me just say the topic of alcohol is its own sermon and controversial, but I am in the camp that says uh, the moderate use of alcohol in some settings is okay. And I base this on um, the reading of a number of passages. Uh, in particular, what Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians chapters 8, 9, and 10, where he is talking about meat sacrifice to idols, which is not our issue, but it was the issue of the day, and he talks about how to think about an issue that the Bible has not definitively spoken about. So in, in the first century, uh, there were lots of, of pagan temples. Uh, and in the, church in, in the church that Paul is writing to in Corinth, 
uh, there were lots of pagan temples. So I just got back. It was 20 of us that were uh, in, in Turkey, and we were looking at, we were visiting the churches that Jesus writes to in Revelations chapter 2 and 3. So Pergamum and Sardis and Philadelphia and Thyatira and Ephesus, and there's a number of churches that are mentioned in Revelation. Corinth is in Greece, we didn't visit Corinth, but similar kind of setting, there are pagan temples, temples to Zeus and Trajan and Dionysius and other things. And these temples uh, were, were places where uh, idol worship was happening. They were also places often of, of pretty significant sexual immorality because they, you would try and entice the gods and get their attention and orgies was a way to get the gods' attention. And they were also a place where meat was sacrificed. And some of the meat that was sacrificed was then sold on the market at the grocery store. And it was sold for less money because it had already, in one sense, had been used for something. So the question becomes, for the Christians living there, can I eat meat that has been sacrificed to an idol? And it's a, it's a complicated question in part because they often didn't know whether it had been sacrificed to an idol. And if they went to their friend's house for dinner, they didn't know whether that meat had been sacrificed to an idol. And so they ask, how are we to think about this? And in a series of chapters in 1 Corinthians, Paul develops his thinking. And he says, look, this is how you think about these things. And, and he comes out and he says, look, can you eat meat that's sacrificed to an idol? Yes, because in fact, there's no such thing. There's no power behind an idol. An idol is nothing. There, there's no supernatural activity here. This is just a, a nothing. So it hasn't been compromised in that sense. However, he says, it would be wrong for you to eat meat that's been sacrificed to an idol if the, the meat was sacrificed at a public celebration and you were participating in the public celebration and the worship of an idol. Then it would be wrong. Or if it violates your conscience, if you think it's wrong, it's wrong. Or if you might be hurting someone else by doing this. So he talks at some length about sort of the, the new believer, the, the less established believer who might find themselves uh, struggling and suffering if they see a, a more mature Christ follower doing this. So he, he writes about all this and says, this is um, you know, how, how you are to think about this. So I come to the issue of alcohol and uh, realize that Christians fall into sort of four camps. There's some that say, uh, you can drink whatever you want and you can get drunk, which to me is a clear wrong. Ephesians 5.18 says, do not be drunk. Do not get drunk with wine. That is, that is dissipation. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So don't be drunk with wine. Sometimes the word dissipation is translated debauchery. Sometimes it's translated ruin your life. But basically, you don't want to you don't want to go there. You don't want to give up control of your life. That's not wise living. That's not who you've been called to be. You want to yield your life increasingly to God, not to something like alcohol. So I'd say that camp is wrong. Then there's a group that says, there's, there are situations in which the moderate consumption of alcohol is okay, provided you know, you're not getting drunk and provided it doesn't violate your conscience and provided that you're not causing someone else to stumble. So there's some situations in drink which drinking would be wrong, but there's some situations in which it might be right. <clears throat> there's a third group of Christians that say, I'm just going to avoid the whole thing, and I'm not, I'm not ever going to drink out of conviction or out of because I've got alcoholism in my family or because of others. For whatever reason, I'm not, I'm not going to go there. And it's okay. If you drink, I'm not going to drink. That's my conviction. <clears throat> And then there's a, a fourth group that says, um, I'm not going to drink and no Christian should drink because it's wrong. Now, I have a problem with this camp because <clears throat> Jesus drank and he turned water into wine and he used wine at communion and we're instructed <clears throat> not to add rules. <laughs> we, we can't make up rules to the way the Christian life works. So I'm in the camp that says <clears throat> moderate use of alcohol in some settings is okay. So there are people that say, well, then you just have to apply that same standard to marijuana. And if the moderate use of, of alcohol in some settings is okay, then the moderate use of marijuana in some settings is okay. 
Um, so that's, that is a camp. Then there's another camp. You go a little bit uh, further on. By the way, let me just pause to say, 1 Corinthians uh, has a great little metric for you. Uh, the 6, 8, 10 principle is what it's sometimes called. It was written by Leroy Imes. And he says, you're trying to make a decision. You look at chapters uh, 6, 12, 1 Corinthians 6, 12, 8, I think it's 24, and 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So 6, 12 says, is it, it, we're free in Christ. The question is, is it helpful? In Christ, I have freedom. The question is, is it helpful? Is, this, is doing this going to help me or possibly harm me? 1 Corinthians 8 is, is it going to help other people or is it going to hurt other people? And 1 Corinthians 10, 31 is, is it going to glorify God? So when I'm looking at a moral issue that the Bible doesn't say anything about, I'm asking, is this good? Is it helpful? Is it, is it help me? Is it going to help other people? And is it going to glorify God? So... In light of all that, that, that view says treat it like alcohol. Uh, the sixth view says um, marijuana is okay for medical use, but not okay for recreational use. And then the seventh view says marijuana is never okay, not for medical use or uh, for recreational use. So um, I'm, I'm not going to keep you in suspense. I'm in the sixth camp that says no recreationally and yes medically. And I have arrived at this opinion um, on, on the basis of what I would say is sort of biblically informed wisdom. So it's, it's, a, it's a balance of looking at a lot of different factors, starting with scripture. And I sort of came away with five reasons why I will choose not to partake in recreational marijuana. Uh, the first is because I think it violates pretty clearly Ephesians 5, uh, 18. It says, do not be drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now, to say don't be drunk with wine doesn't mean you can be drunk with scotch uh, or be drunk with beer. You just can't be drunk with wine. It's the principle, don't yield control of your life. Don't get drunk. Don't get buzzed. And so uh, I think my experience with recreational marijuana is that um, excuse me, I, I have no personal experience with recreational marijuana, <laughs> but my understanding of, of marijuana with my friends that were smoking marijuana to get buzzed is that you smoke marijuana to get buzzed. The whole point was to get buzzed. And as I understand it today, the toxicity of marijuana is so high that it's virtually impossible to, to partake in marijuana and not get buzzed. And so uh, I would see this as recreational marijuana as a violation of Ephesians 5.18. Additionally, I'll choose not to participate in recreational marijuana because it doesn't lead to the life that I want to live. So I would like to be a good steward of my life. I believe we're called to that, the parable of the talents and other things that we've been given gifts and opportunities and we're supposed to use those and steward those well. And I, I don't think that partaking in marijuana is likely to lead down that path. And so I would choose not to go there. The third reason uh, I am gonna choose not to participate in marijuana is because it's not the example that I wanna leave. So uh, I, have some, um, I have some influence perhaps as a pastor, but set that aside. It's not the example I wanna leave for my boys. And it's not the example I want to leave if we have grandchildren. It's not the example I want to give to my friends. Uh, I don't want to head down that path because I don't want that to be the example they get from me. A uh, fourth reason I'm choosing not to head down this path is because um, I don't want any addictions. And to be honest, I think life is hard enough when we are navigating it without those kind of challenges. As a pastor, I see many people who have fallen into addictions for all kinds of reasons, and they're horrible. And, uh, and it's clear that marijuana leads to addictions at a far higher rate than alcohol does. And so I just think it's, uh, it's, it's dangerous. A, a friend of mine who three or four years ago uh, uh, sort of made a, a commitment to Christ fraternity brother, uh, had smoked marijuana almost daily, I think, for six years through college and into grad school. And then he quit. And he's one I sent my sermon out to 
doctors and therapists and, and friends that are using marijuana and friends that used to use marijuana and asked them to sort of read it and help me think this through. And I sent it to him and he wrote back and he said, uh, he's very thankful that when he went to quit, he could quit. He said, my experience is, in my friends all smoking marijuana you know, daily for years, we all went to quit and only half of us could. And he also said that uh, about half of that group came down with um, schizophrenia or, or other mental health issues. And he says, I, he goes, I'm, I'm thankful to God, I'm thankful to the genetic disposition that I have that I was able to walk away from this and others were not necessarily able to do so. But uh, I just don't wanna head down a path of having an addiction. Um, fifth reason that I'm choosing not to participate in recreational marijuana is because I don't find the arguments for it very compelling. So uh, there are some who have said, look, if you drink coffee, you've already said you're gonna engage with a psychoactive agent. You know, drinking coffee and smoking marijuana are, are the same. I said, okay, nice try. Uh, <laughs> not really, it's, it's, it's a ridiculous try. I mean, you drink coffee to be more alert, uh, not to be less alert. So I don't find that very compelling. Uh, I, I did have to stop and think longer about the idea that if you drink alcohol, you need to treat marijuana the same way. And here's what I would say about this. It, it led me to, to decide, not that I should treat marijuana differently, because I, I just think the deleterious effects of marijuana are well established and I would not want people to head down that path. It caused me to think that I need to probably say more by way of warning about alcohol than I do. So, uh, as a pastor, Probably every week, I talk with people who struggle with alcohol. And some of them know that they struggle with alcohol, and they're honest about it. Some of them uh, don't know that they struggle with alcohol. Uh, some of them know that they struggle with alcohol, but are not honest with them, with, about it. And so I know they struggle with alcohol, they know they struggle with alcohol, but we can't agree that they struggle with alcohol. So, uh, look, if you're drinking every day, or nearly every day, or if you're drinking in order to cope, or, 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 or you, you're looking for, yeah, you're just looking for ways to try and navigate the challenges of life, and you're drinking, then you have a problem or you're headed to a problem. And perhaps I haven't said that often enough. And so I, I wanna say, we should be navigating life uh, without the aid of alcohol. Jesus turned water into wine at a wedding. It was for a, it was for a celebration. Feels very different if somebody's drinking at a wedding than if somebody's drinking at a funeral or after a funeral. I mean, there's, there's, there are parameters to this, and I think we've got to be more cautious than perhaps we have been. So, um, and, and I also think that the that the effects of marijuana are so much becoming so much more significant than uh, the immediate effects of alcohol that I'm not persuaded by that argument. So. Uh, Look, I also think that it's wrong to use recreational marijuana because I believe that some level of stress and anxiety is probably appropriate in life. And I do not want anyone to be in significant amounts of pain. But I think we have been in a 20 year cycle where we've tried to alleviate all pain. And, and that's just not a way that we can live successfully. And so I want to say, um, look, 100 years ago, if you were melancholy, uh, if you were suffering from insomnia, if you were going through a difficult, unsettling time, people then would say, I think God's trying to get my attention. The Lord is dealing with me. I've got, I've got, I've got to process some things. And that might be uncomfortable, but it would often lead you to more root issues of what's going on. Today, we're very quick to say, I need a pill. Better living through chemicals. Now, whenever I say something like this, let me say again, I am not against uh, medication. And if you're on medication for depression or anxiety, do not stop on the basis of anything that I'm saying. I'm not qualified to give you a prescription. I'm not qualified to take you off a prescription. So, and I take medication. I take medication for ADHD. 
I am not against medication. Uh, but I think we're too quick to head down this path, and I think there are opportunities for us to, to see the stresses and challenges of, of the life that we're living shape us and to drive us more significantly back to the Lord. Now, I've hardly begun to uh, exhaust this topic. I've not even broached the subject of why suddenly so many people are finding the need to numb the pain of life. And if you're on the side that thinks that, that uh, marijuana is bad and horrible, then you're wanting me to say, look, it's a gateway drug. And, and in addition to that, uh, it's complex and we don't understand it. And, and it clearly leads to mental illness. And, and, and the legalization of marijuana is going to lead to the further d sort of bifurcation of society between the haves and the have-nots. And it's going to pull those people on the underside of the middle class further down. Uh, yes, I get that. And if you're on the other side, you're gonna say, look, why are you singling out marijuana? There's so many things that are much worse than this, and marijuana is not nearly as bad as, as alcohol in terms of the problems that it causes in family, and we can't win the war on drugs, and, and laws against marijuana are discriminatory, and in many cases, blatantly racist, and uh, if we make it legal, we can control the quality, and there'd be the tax benefits and other things. So. Yeah, we'll talk about some of these things tonight if you want to come back. Here's what I want to say as, as, a, as a pastor. Um, in six weeks, you will have the legal opportunity to participate in recreational marijuana. Um, I will choose not to, and I would encourage you not to. I would say the life you want is not going to be found through marijuana. It's found through a deeper walk with Christ. And if you are finding that that is not taking you where you need to go, then we need to, we need to talk about that. We need to pursue that more rigorously, and you may need more and better friends. But what you don't need is marijuana. Let me pray for us. Father, I uh, want to start by praying for those for whom this is a, a, a daily challenge and struggle, whether their challenge and struggle or a spouse or a child or good friends, um, Father, may they find in you hope and, um, and grace. And may they find it, this church hope and grace and encouragement and not condemnation or embarrassment or surprise. But uh, Father, may we be gracious to one another as you were gracious to us and provide hope and ways forward. And I pray Father, for uh, the ability for us to graciously and thoughtfully navigate the challenges that we face in this life and in this culture and to do so in ways that are full of joy and winsome and um, life-giving uh, for others as well as for ourselves. So guide and direct us to that end, we pray in Christ's name, amen.